I guess my father made too much money at Canyon and went overboard and bought Bumblebee and 1,000 head of cattle that went with it before the Depression. And when the Depression did hit, it got real bad. The banks foreclosed on him, but he had the choice to keep Canyon or Bumblebee. Look at Black Canyon City. He owned most of it at that time. Also, the road changed. It is now I-17. While at Bumblebee, when I was a little fella, I used to stutter a lot and stammer. My father would set me down and make me start all over again. Maybe you have noticed it on the tape when I talked. When he encouraged me not to talk that way, he told me a story about his cousin when they were kids. His cousin stuttered a lot and other kids sure teased him. Kids can sometimes be mean. They found him one time. He had hung himself in a barn. That was why my father done all he could do to help me, and that he did. I remember one time while at Bumblebee, we heard there would be a big barbecue at Horse Thief. So three of us guys decided to go up there horseback. We didn't have to do that. Other people came by car, but we thought we were tough. We went to Horse Thief and on, and on to Crown King. We danced all night at Tom Anderson's saloon and on back to Horse Thief to the barbecue given by Lawton Champy. That was when the Forest Service turned over the Horse Thief Basin to the city of Phoenix. The governor of the state was there, a Mr. Hunt. Later on, the three C's built the dam and the cabin and corrals where they had the barbecue is covered by the water. The three C's done lots of good for the country. They also built lots of trails. At Bumblebee, us kids were taught not to like the road runners, the bird that didn't fly. I think they ate the little chicks that we had. One day I was in a jeep at the Tip Top Ranch going to the headquarters ranch on the Alfreya. While on the way, I seen this roadrunner jumping up and down. I had a 22 rifle with me, so I shot and killed it. When I drove on up there, it had killed a rattlesnake by jumping up and down on it. I felt bad about doing that. I remember while we were at Bumblebee, my Uncle Joe Mar had a violin that he played by music, and he thought I could play it too. So he gave it to me. I finally learned to play Home Sweet Home by the notes. And one day, I caught my brother Joe playing old time music on it by ear, so I gave it to him. It was then a fiddle. I learned to play the guitar, and we had a good time. We finally got to play for the dances, Canyon, Crown King, and Bumblebee. That was when they danced all night. A big pot of coffee that they brewed outside, and the women brought cake and sandwiches. And we played the Midnight Waltz. Sometimes we also played till daylight. That was good times. One time, three brothers, the Shells, they had cattle on Black Mesa and the Alafria. The youngest brother always was looking for a fight. The two older ones always had to help him out, but they got tired of it. They told him one time at the Crown King dance they wouldn't help him anymore. But sure enough, Alex, the younger one, got in trouble, so his two brothers took and tied him with his arms around a pine tree. I remember the next morning he had kicked the bark off the bottom of the tree. But after that, he was always good at the dances. That is what they call brotherly love. I forgot to tell, I got a job at the French Lily Mine south of Cleeter. 
That was next to Poland Creek. I learned to run the hoist, and while operating it one night, it was sure storming and lightning. All at once, the lightning struck the transformer behind the hoist house. It is hard to describe, but a big ball of blue came through the window and jumped up and down on the work table. It was looking for a ground. It could have come to me, but it jumped on the cable, climbed the cable to the shiv wheel, and down the shaft. It was a good thing the bucket wasn't on the wet ground. It would have killed the two miners. Another story that I missed before. I went back to work at the ML Ranch in the 1960s. A man by the name of Mr. Patterson had bought it. Charlie Morgan was foreman and he had known me all of my life. At one time he had cattle at the Tip Top Ranch. While I was there he sent me down to help his uncle Lawton Champy to help gather his cattle at Spring Roundup. We held the steers and cattle in a pasture, and one morning we got up early to take the steers to the shipping pens. I was riding point on the right side. When a steer broke out behind me, I turned to rope or bring him back. The cold jawed horse I was riding got the bit in his mouth and stampeded with me. I saw the low mesquite men coming, so I had to fall off backwards to miss it. But that didn't hurt me. But I had the coils in my right hand, and the rope was tied. I got rid of the coils, except the loop, and the crazy horse started dragging me. They said I was sure a hollering. I think at a time like that, it helps to pray because looking down the rope, I seen it was going through a mes small mesquite bush, and I knew if I went through that, it would pull my arm off. So I prayed to God, and it did help. I hit a rock this side of the bush, and it threw me on its top, saving me from the roots. After I left the Tip Top Ranch, I finally got a job for the Page Landon Cattle Company on the lower Verde River. The headquarters was just above the Fort McDowell Reservation. I worked there for three years and got to see the fountain for the deep well that the city had drilled. I started to get arthritis real bad and I knew that my, my sitting on a horse was real bad for me. The last job I had was for John Klein on the New River Mountains, and I found out the hard way my cowboy days were over, so I came to Crown King to retire. But the happiest days of my life was when I was in camp a working cattle. That is all of the stories for this time, and maybe I can write some more sometime later. Thank you. These are short stories of things that have happened to me and other people in my lifetime. I will start out by telling the stories of old prospect holes, and there is still lots of them in the Bradshaw Mountains. The one I will tell is one that was handed down to me by an old timer. He told about the old tip top mine when it was still a working. He said this miner decided to go see his old friend on one Sunday while visiting a storm came up and he knew he had better head for home. It was raining and also lightning. He thought he was on the trail. Instead of giving his horse his head, he whipped 
and forced his horse into a prospect hole. He was lucky it wasn't too deep. He got out and got help. The miners sat up a two-man windlass and was able to get the horse out. It is best to give the horse his head. He will always get you home. In the dark, he can always see better than you can. While on the subject of prospect holes, I was working cattle for the old ML ranch below the old post office of Wagoner. We were driving a bunch of cattle in the oak brush in Manzanita. A steer broke out and I went to bring him back. I was riding a strong young horse. All at once he wheeled and came back. He probably saved my life. It's a dirty shame with cattle on the open range, the miners cannot cover the open holes if they don't make mines of them. When you are working cattle, sometimes in the brush, you are looking ahead. It can be sometimes very dangerous. It seems I can't get away from prospect holes, but this one is a little different. One time, a working cattle for Fred Cordes, the double F, I heard this cow bawling up a sand wash. When I got up there, I found this six-month-old calf down a hole. It wasn't too deep. I got my rope on him, and my horse pulled him out. I got off my horse to take the rope off him, and he charged me. He didn't appreciate what all I had done. Oh, well. While I was working for the ML Ranch, Rizonico, the owner, bought the cattle from the Van Telborgs. We had to get them off of their range. I was riding a half-broke mule one day, and I was riding him using what we call draw reins. That was in Ash Basin near Crown King. The mule we called Blackjack and I got tangled up in a wild grapevine. The more he fought, the worse it got. I even had a vine across my neck, and I couldn't get to my pocket knife. All I could do was holler, but finally Rizonico himself came to the rescue. With his dehorn and saw and pocket knife, he finally got us loose. If Blackjack and I had no help, they would have wondered years later who the skeletons were in the grapevine. Ha! Huh. Back on, like all of us when we were kids, because I had ridden a few broncs, I dreamed of being a professional bronc rider. I even entered at the rodeo in Dewey, given by Perry Henderson. While riding this bronc, the saddle I was in was pretty large for me anyhow. I was pretty small. The horse made a few jumps, and I hit the saddle horn. I think other guys have done the same thing, because the association saddles nowadays don't have the horn. When I picked myself up out of the dirt, I went out behind the chutes. Perry Henderson saw me and helped me take my chaps and Levi's down, but there was no blood. I had ruptured myself. While on the way to Phoenix the next day from Bumblebee to see the family doctor, I could see my mother was provoked with me. She told me I could hurt myself enough taking care of my own cattle without making a fool of myself. It was sure the truth. We learned the hard way. My, my father had turned over the remnants of the cattle he had once owned to me. While the doctor examined me, I asked him if I should wear a truss, and he sure got mad. He said I would outgrow it. I was only 18 at the time. The muscles grew around it, I guess, and at the present time, I am okay. 
Back on the horse traders, one time on the M.L. Ranch, Rizonico bought one of them in Prescott and brought him to the ranch. He was one I had in my string. I saddled him up one morning. He didn't buck with me, but I still didn't trust him. While going up a sand wash to where we were to work that day, I raised to one side to miss a cottonwood limb, and that was when he got me, bucked me off backwards, and I hit the back of my head in the sand. I think I had a slight concussion because I don't remember a thing that day. The next morning, I couldn't go to work. I had a terrible headache. While in the bunkhouse that day, I even seen little people coming out of the wall to my bed. I think it, I think it was to shake my hand, but I finally got well, maybe, ha ha. I know during the d depression, the only jobs around here were just mines and cowboying, and I was lucky to be able to work at both. The job I had at the Golden Turkey Mine only paid $3 a shift, and they took out $1 a day for board whether you ate there or not. Sometimes I ate at the boarding house, but I was married at the time, and I couldn't see doing that. I was a mucker there, and if we didn't get cleaned out for the miner so he could set his machine up, there was always a line of men a wanton work to take our place. I finally got a job at the Aura Bell, south of Crown King. They paid more, five dollars a shift. The old man that opened the mine up said he had a dream when he was super there years ago that the old mine had missed a rich body of ore on the 400 foot level. That was where we worked. Those days, we depended on the old carbide lamps. It was bad in the drift, not much air, and gas from the old timbers. The carbide lamp would go out when you put it on the floor of the drift. One day the power went off, and Bill Nelson, that was Tony Nelson's uncle, was horseman. He blinked the lights, and we knew we had to climb out. At every hundred feet on the ladder was a landing to rest. On the first landing, my partner had a heart attack. People didn't know about CPR those days, but I talked and begged him to keep climbing. We still had 300 feet to go. Not too far, but with a sick man in front of you, it's a long way. He was much larger than I was, and if he had fallen on me, we both would have been killed. I did get him to the collar. They took him to town, but he didn't come back. That is why the men should have a physical before they hire them. The small minds got away with that. I remember the road to Orabel was always rough, and it still is. The foreman of the mine always gave two of us one day a week to repair the rock walls and fill in dirt. We were always glad to get out of, to get out of that hole. The mine finally went broke. I think the old man had died. I moved to Crown King and finally went back to the Golden Turkey. Because I was small, they hired me to work in the small low stoves. They were high grading and ready to close down. They had me drilling with a jackhammer across my chest, breathing the exhaust. Sometimes I even drilled dry, so I didn't last long. One day, my wife and I went to Bumblebee for groceries. My father had the store. While we were shopping, I started coughing, and my father was an old miner. He knew what it was. Nothing I could do but go to Prescott in the hospital. They even took my shoes and Levi's away so I would stay.
Jews. My father, Jeff, told me he was born in Missouri and raised in Nebraska and Kansas. He said they lived in old sod houses, and many a time they woke up in the morning with a sleet of snow on their bed. That was cold. He thought about changing his life like young fellows do and decided to go to Colorado where the mines were. Said he followed a plow to get there. He meant for something to eat on the way. He worked at Leadville and Cripple Creek. That was when they had to use single jacks and double jacks. There was no air machines to drill with. He said the miners drilled a hole in the end of the hammer handle with a thong around their wrist so they would have their own always. He told me he was drilling one day. It was on an uppercut, a hole above his head. He missed the drill, and when he came to, his helper was pouring water on him. He had hit his head between the eyes. You had to be tough those days. He decided to finally get out of the cold up there, so he came to Arizona. He heard there was mines here too. He got a job at the old Monarch mine out of the old town of Cherry. On his days off, he would go down to the towns on the Verde River. That was where he met my mother. My mother's father, Dennis Marr, had lots of cattle and his headquarters was at the mouth of Beaver Creek, a place they called Altman. It even had a post office. The Verde River, in a big flood one time, washed it all away. My mother and father married in 1904, and that was when they moved and started the store at Canyon. Later on, my brother Joe, sister Enid, and I were born at my grandfather, Martin, and grandmother's place in Phoenix. My mother used to laugh and say we were born in a chicken coop. My grandfather, Martin, had fixed up a chicken house. On my birth certificate, it says place of birth in 1916 was one and a half miles east of the old Indian school. That would be somewhere near 12th Street. My grandfather, Martin, had a small farm there. Things have sure changed. After my father started the store in Canyon, my mother said it was a three-day trip to Phoenix and back. One day down with their horse and wagons, one day to load up, and one day to come back. Lots of times, pack boars would be waiting and they loaded them up off of the wagons. Never got the groceries into the little store. A lot of times they would go back for another load and sometimes my mother went with them. They had a lot of sheep trade that was seasonal. This is a funny story that happened on the ML Ranch. One I won't forget. Lewis Shields of the foreman sent me to Minnehaha Flats with the horses. We always called it Minnehaha. Martin had a small farm there. Things have sure changed. After my father started the store in Canyon, my mother said it was a three-day trip to Phoenix one day down with their horse and wagons, one day to load up, and one day to come back. Lots of times, pack boars would be waiting, and they loaded them up off of the wagons, never got the groceries into the little store. A lot of times, they would go back for another load the same day, and sometimes my mother went with them. They had a, a lot of sheep trade that was seasonal. This is a story I almost forgot, one that happened on the ML Ranch. 
it was funny. And one I won't forget. Lewis Shields, the foreman, sent me to Minnehaha Flats. We always called it Minnehaha, with the horses for spring roundup. I knew we had to work on the small pasture for the cattle, so I kept the horses in the corral for the night. The next morning, Lewis still hadn't come. He had told me that he had to go to Prescott for supplies. Maybe he got the drinking, and sometimes he did that. It was about noon when I started to get hungry. People that stayed there for the winter had a small baby, and all I could find was a few jars of baby food. But I survived. Lewis came the next day, and we started work on the fence. We had lots of brushing to do before we could repair it. I was working below Lewis when I heard him a hollering. It sounded like a Comanche, and he was Irish Indian. He had the axe in his hand, and he was sure waving it, coming toward me. I thought the drink had got to him, so I sure outrun him. What he had done, he chopped into a wasp nest, and they were stinging him on the back. But I thought, he was after me. I've had people ask me if I ever got lonesome out in cow camp. I have sometimes been out there three or four months at a time. I think it pays to be a nature lover, which I have always been. My job at the Tip Top Ranch was always to check the dirt tanks and springs in the summertime. While I went to check a dirt tank one morning, I heard a coyote a yapping. I then seen him chasing this little fawn. I didn't have my gun that day, so I did the next best thing. I ran my horse and hollered between them. I gave the little deer a little while longer to live. The mother deer always hid the fawn before they went off to graze. While going up this canyon one day to check a spring and trough, I seen something out of the corner of my eye. It was a yearling deer eating on an oak brush up on the bank above me, only about 20 feet. I stopped to talk to her, and then I rode on. I looked back, and she was still eating. She knew I was harmless. When I got to the Willow Springs, it was okay, but like always, I had patching to do on the black plastic pipeline. The line wasn't buried. The varmints always chewed into it if they could hear the water running. I always blamed it on the coyotes. My grandmother Mar told me that her family, the Pratts, came from Illinois in a wagon and that she was the oldest and helped with the other kids. She said they brought a milk cow tied to the wagon and had milk if they had to make a dry camp at night. They made it to Arizona and settled on the mouth of Beaver Creek. The crops failed the first year and her father decided to head back to Illinois. The old road went up what they called Snebley Hill. I-17 goes up there now. On top of the hill, they met the mailman on his horse. He told them he heard a bad snowstorm was coming, so they went back. So thanks to the snowstorm, I am around today. Ha! My grandmother was 20 years younger than my grandfather, so she remembered things that he told her very well. He told her he started out as a cabin boy on the old sailing vessels, and as a watchman and cabin boy, he got varicose veins from being on his feet so much. She said he kept them wrapped while they were married. He told her that they went around the Cape of Horn in sailing vessels. That was a long trip. They probably lived on fish. He said they all got the scurvy one time 
and he said the captain docked in South America. They had lots of apples aboard, so they traded them for onions. He said the onions saved their lives. Another one she told me, the vessel he was on landed in San Francisco. He heard through the grapevine that they were finding gold and doing mining in Arizona. He waited for his brother Joe. He was on another ship. They finally decided to go to Arizona, bought horses and mules, and came by the way of Death Valley with other men. They lost a few of their horses and mules, and some of them had to walk. They did make it to the Colorado River at Ehrenberg, dying of thirst. There was friendly Indians there, the Mojaves. When the men rushed to the river to drink, the Indians stopped them. The Indians had goats that they milked and fed them a little of the milk at a time, probably a spoonful. My grandfather told her that they saved their lives. The Marr brothers, Dennis and Joe, started their cattle business by going to Mexico and buying them for the price of chickens, herded them across the desert to the ranch on the Verde. They had cattle on Mingus Mountain, the Verde, and Lonesome Valley. My grandmother said it was in the late 1860s and the people hadn't got over the Civil War yet. I think lots of them got started in the cow business from the Marr brothers, but they were not Yankees. They originally came from Ireland. My grandmother told me another story of a cowboy working for my grandfather in Lonesome Valley. She said his horse fell in a prairie dog hole and broke the cowboy's leg. He did make it to the railroad that went to the town of Jerome and when the train did come, he tried to flag it down, but the engineer didn't stop, and the cowboy died. She said his mother in Camp Verde sued the railroad and collected. I can remember when there was lots of prairie dogs in that country. If you will turn the tape over, I will finish with a few more stories. Thank you. when there was lots of prairie dogs in that country. If you turn the tape over, I will try to talk some more. Thank you.